Coming up on DTNS, ZTE kills the notch. Apple makes peace with third-party repair, sort of, but not peace with Epic. And Allison Sheridan tells us how cool it is to make an open source ebook. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, August 17th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And from the Podfeed Podcast, I'm Allison Sheridan. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Uh, we were just talking about insurance, but also <laughs> some fun stuff uh, on Good Day Internet. Get get the uh, get the expanded show and uh, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Canada and Germany have launched separate antitrust investigations into Amazon related to third party sellers. Canada is looking at how Amazon policies affect pricing and availability of products off of Amazon, encourage use of Amazon services like fulfillment or advertising, and whether Amazon favors its own competing products for sale. Germany's investigation is focused on how Amazon affects the prices that sellers set. The U.S. Department of Commerce announced new restrictions on selling chips to Huawei, trying to close some loopholes. Off-the-shelf designs from third-party design houses based on U.S. processes will now require a license. It also expands the definition of when a license is needed to include any time Huawei acts, quote, as a purchaser, intermediate consignee, ultimate consignee, or end user. And they added 38 Huawei affiliates across 21 countries to the list affected by the restrictions. That brings the total of Huawei affiliates affected to 152. On Friday, Instagram users started seeing a list of new messaging features, including a way to chat with users on Facebook. The update also added a colorful redesign, swipe to reply, more emoji reactions, and changed the DM icon to the Facebook Messenger logo. However, actual cross-platform chat does not yet appear to be enabled. North Dakota and Wyoming joined Virginia as U.S. states with contact tracing apps available based on the Apple Google Exposure Notification platform. Alabama is also expanding its contact tracing app to be available statewide. Washington and Pennsylvania are also expected to launch their apps within the next few weeks. The President of the United States issued an executive order Friday giving ByteDance 90 days to sell or spin off TikTok in the U.S. A previous order would have blocked all transactions with ByteDance by U.S. companies if TikTok had not been sold by September 20th. The new date is November 12th and not my wedding anniversary. So that's nice. It also includes a requirement to destroy all U.S. user data after a sale. Google wrote an open letter arguing against proposed rules from Australia's Competition and Consumer Commission. Those proposed rules would require Google and Facebook to negotiate payments for carrying news stories in all search results. Public comment on the proposed rules ends August 28th. In an interview discussing gig workers, Just Eat Takeaway CEO Jitsi Grain said, quote, it's our intent not to have those in Europe. Grain further said that the company may use freelance workers in other countries if it could pay for workers' insurance. Just Eat Takeaway is currently evaluating how to classify workers in Canada with plans to look at the U.S. later on. Just Eat Takeaway announced in June it intends to buy Grubhub. Oh, grab your popcorn, fans. Epic shared a letter from Apple that tells Epic Games to cure its breaches of the developer agreement or Apple will terminate Epic's membership in the Apple Developer Program on August 28th. Termination would stop Epic from being able to distribute iOS or Mac apps. In fact, on Mac, you have to be notarized to run on current OSs. It would stop that. Epic says it asked the court to block the move. It's unknown what effect this would have on Epic's Unreal Engine, which is used to power thousands of games, including many games in Apple Arcade. Microsoft announced it will end support for Inter Internet Explorer 11 across its Microsoft 365 apps and services August 17th, 2021. So you have a year, folks. IE 11 support for Microsoft Teams will go away sooner on November 30th. Sites built for IE can still be accessed in the IE legacy mode built into Edge. Speaking of Edge, the old non-Chromium version of Edge will lose support March 9th. <sighs> They're actually getting a simple world on Windows. Yay. All right. Let's talk a little more about in-display cameras. ZTE announced that its upcoming Axon 20 5G phone will have an under-display selfie camera, meaning no notch, no punch hole, no bevel, nothing, uh, no pop-up 
Oppo, a different company, has shown a prototype of an underscreen camera before. Uh, that one had a little bit of haze in it, at least to, to people with keener eyes than me. This, however, would be the first mass-produced phone to have an under-display camera. ZTE did not release any more specs about the Axon 25G. They just wanted to make a note about that. The phone launches September 1st. You know, I've said for a long time, and this is probably just because I've never had it any other way, the notches just don't bother me. I don't feel like, gosh, look at all that screen real estate that's just being taken up by this stupid little black thing on the top of my iPhone. Um, the pop-up, I that would not appeal to me. That's just, it's like, a, you know, me sitting on it. It's an accident waiting to happen. Uh, and then, you know, there's the punch hole type thing. I mean, everyone's kind of trying to get around the fact that we want a full 100% uh, of the front screen available. You know, the fingerprint reader now that's in the screen. So you don't have to add anything to the, the rest of the phone that makes it bulkier or takes away from the visuals. The camera, you know, in, in theory, I'm like, that's impossible, right? Because the camera would have to be going through whatever's on the screen because you're going to have things on the screen from time to time. But I guess if the phone and you know the sensor and everything involved is smart enough to say okay everything that we're seeing you kind of flip it and take it out and you get a clear picture that way i mean that's awesome it seems impossible to me but i i can't imagine that we would be going in any other direction at this point so one thing about that sarah you make a really good point is that what what i think you're going to end up seeing i'm going to predict right here is that the images from this will be at the very least slightly darker than you would get if it didn't have to also provide transmission of the of the imagery on the glass because you you pretty much can't have both think about like a, a one-way mirror you know how it's you can see through it but it's kind of darker i think you're going to get an effect like that just by the nature of you know the physics of optics and then it comes down to how good the algorithm is at rebrightening it, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah, yeah, no, yeah. none of these images are ever left uh, alone. They'll they'll try to make process. it look back to natural, and we'll see how good that that works. It is the selfie cam, right? It's not the front. It's the front facing cam. Those are always a little less high right. resolution than than the camera on the back of a phone. So I think that's why they're thinking they could probably get away with it. And they, and they may have cracked the algorithm. Who knows? I, I can't wait to see it. Well, and when it comes to selfie cams, I mean, everybody, we've, we've all got our own little tricks, but it tends to be the camera that is of you, you know, or you and a friend that's next to you or that sort of thing. So to be able to kind of like add a little of the right HDR and maybe a little smoothing on that selfie cam, it might end up that people are like, ZTE has the best selfie cam ever and it's invisible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, notch haters rejoice. Here's your phone. <laughs> you win. Uh, the Messenger app Telegram added an alpha version of video calls to Android and iOS in the U.S. As with messaging and audio, video calls now can be end-to-end -end encrypted. Call participants can confirm a call is encrypted by comparing four emojis shown on the screen, and the feature also includes picture-in-picture. -picture. Now, Allison, I know you, you actually wrote a blog post about how much you like Telegram, so... So uh, so how does this new encryption feature make it all the more sweeter for you? Well, being able to do video inside the app that is end-to-end -end encrypted is is definitely cool. And I am a card-carrying Apple fangirl. You know, I've got it a tattooed on my shirt. Uh, but I still just can't stand uh, messages. You know, the blue-green bubble wars, I just, I just want everybody to be able to play on the same field. Um, Playing field, you know, and and the way messages get thread get tangled, the threads get all messed up. You can't edit what you've done. That's kind of the stuff I wrote about. Adding this video uh, in in the app, being able to do video chat along with audio chat, that's all encrypted. That's awesome. I love it. Yeah, it's. I mean, Telegram is extremely popular in large swaths of the world, uh, especially your Eastern Europe uh, and and Turkey and and places like that. Uh, I know it has a huge user numbers. It is one of the more secure uh, messaging systems out there. When you hear it criticized for being insecure, it's usually because Telegram was often marketing itself as comparable to Signal, which Signal is, by all accounts, the best encryption you can get in messaging, and Telegram doesn't quite measure up to that. But when you compare it to WhatsApp, Telegram is perfectly secure, and certainly when you compare it to Messenger, or like you say, the Messages app built into Android or, or iOS, it's 
crazy more secure than that. So and, and not having video sourced, calling, I think, was an essential feature for Telegram. Yeah, yeah, they I, and they've they've open sourced their encryp encryption algorithm. They did roll their own, and that's what security uh, specialists get annoyed at them for. But they did open source it, so you can look at it and see if you think they're doing it right. All right, uh, let's talk about something happening in the schools. Well, Axios' uh, Dan Premack reports that American students are facing a laptop shortage, particularly among low-cost Chromebooks commonly used in K-8 schools. Sales of Chromebooks began to surge as COVID-19 lockdowns began in March, with analysts at MPD Group consistently seeing weekly sales up 20 to 40 percent on the year, even as analysts at Gartner saw PC shipments increasing much slower at 0.8 percent in Q1 and 3.5 percent in Q2. Acer America President Greg Prendergast says that there are, they are not even close to enough Chromebooks to meet the demand as schools reopen. Part of the issue is the overall shortage of components for laptops, further disrupting laptop manufacturing capability. Yeah, uh, whew, this is a tough one because uh, you had a spike in demand beyond what was expected. So even if everything else in the world was working perfectly, they would have had trouble meeting demand because we suddenly saw more demand than logistics experts would have been expecting. But of course, the reason for the spike in demand was the same reason that manufacturing experienced some interruptions. Uh, and so that caused a shortage in both fully assembled Chromebooks as well as the parts. Uh, so this, this is a problem. I don't know if it's the thing that is, you know, there's so many problems with with schooling right now because of uh, worries about transmission of the virus and mixing remote learning with in-person learning safely and, and all of that. In fact, uh, Justin Robert Young's Politics, Politics, Politics program did a great special on those issues. If you're interested in that, go listen to it. He talked to some folks about the Brookings Institution who were saying, yeah, you know, tech is a problem, but there are even bigger problems like just having parents home if they have if both parents have to work uh to to be able to help kids with distance learning uh i didn't see any estimates of how fast manufacturing might be able to catch up and I, i'm curious how long this this shortage might last because it may be something that where schools can sort of get by with the equipment they have uh temporarily uh the problem is they've been using this equipment so much because of distance learning that the chromebooks they have are starting to wear out faster too which means higher replacements I mean, uh, I'll, I'll say this for, for my child, uh, who's going to be attending kindergarten two days up the block. Uh, the, the, the school district basically had you fill out a form if you needed equipment, if you needed like a Wi-Fi router and you needed a Chromebook. But most of the stuff is applications that can be installed on my wife's six-year-old MacBook Pro. Uh, and would also work on my, you know, all the stuff I have. So I think for, for parents who already have equipment that's maybe within the past five to six years, they're pretty much covered on being able to interact and do all the stuff, uh, all the lesson planning stuff that the school has in, char uh, has in mind. But for, for, you know, areas where access to technology is going to be a little tighter, I'm wondering if they're going to have to either, you know, uh, buy more or maybe just ask for donations uh, from the community. Yeah, the 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 situation is so interesting. It pre presents such logistical challenges because, you know, I remember not even, I don't even remember going to a school district where it was like known that we didn't have enough budget, although I'm sure teachers would disagree with me. But, you know, sometimes you double up with books, right? There are too many kids in the class and we don't all have our own book. And so you do that sort of thing. Well, okay, let's say Roger's daughter has a Chromebook and the kid down the street doesn't have a Chromebook and, and there's like no way that they can participate without this particular piece of technology. Well, you can't just go over to the friend's house and share the Chromebook. It doesn't work that way, at least not right now or not without a lot of pre-planning and, and, you know, and everybody feeling safe about, you know, that some sort of an educational bubble. So, yeah, kind of a mess. All right, here's another school-related mess, but it's for university students, or at least people headed to university. The UK has decided not to issue exam results graded by algorithm for students in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland after accusations that the algorithm was biased against students with poorer backgrounds. Uh, Scotland already had made this same decision earlier. The exams, uh, if you're not familiar, are known as A-levels and are instrumental in acceptance to university. Formal exams were canceled because of the lockdown. So this is where the problem came. Usually, a student might get provisional acceptance 
based on their A-levels uh, by looking at what their ranking was or what the teachers estimate they would get on their A-levels. And then they just have to take the, the test, you know, to fulfill it. But they didn't get to take the test because of the lockdown. So the UK's Office of Qualifications and Examinations Regulation, or of Qual, used student rankings and the historical performance of students from an individual school to estimate A-level performance. Well, guess what? Poorer schools have historically poorer performance, but that doesn't mean that all the students in a poorer school perform poorly. So there were problems. The overall curve of what they determined did fit normal expectations because algorithms are good at big data sets, but thousands of students received grades that were lower than teachers' estimates. 35.6% were lower than teachers' estimates by one full grade. So you can say, well, a few of them might have not just not done as well on the A-level had they taken it, but that's quite a lot more than you would expect. And 3.3% were down by two full grades, which seems unlikely. Fee-paying independent schools, what we in the U.S. would call private schools, saw their grades rise faster than state-funded schools as well, because, again, that historical data was causing a problem. That's yeah, that crazy. doesn't sound good. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's it, like you said, Tom, if it was, you know, a few sort of like, oh, this data doesn't quite fit, 35% being lowered by a full grade when you know, it might be the difference between getting into a really important university for what you'd, you'd like to study in order to get a job later on in life. Huge deal. Two grades, that's insane. But then, of course, if you've got a bunch of public school kids saying, oh, cool, all right, well, now we're in a, a pickle, but some of these independent schools that are expensive that only certain people can go to are seeing a bump in the grades from this algorithm, I, of course, people are going to be mad about that. <laughs> They're going to be mad about everything, right? Well, and it's not like the uh, the teacher estimates aren't also capable of bias. They certainly are. Sure. It's just that everyone was used to using those as the way to provisionally get accepted. So I, I, even though it's probably biased as well, I think people are like, yeah, but that's a bias I'm familiar with. Well, this might be good news <laughs> on this Monday. Apple expanded its program to provide parts and training to independent repair shops for non-warranty repairs to include Macs. Previously, you might recall that Apple only authorized shops to repair iPhones or repairs that were covered by warranty. Third-party shops must be admitted to Apple's independent repair provider program to be eligible to buy parts and also re receive free training materials. Yeah, I am so excited about this. Um, I happen to have the complete and utter luxury of having not one, two, three, but four Apple stores within easy driving distance of my house. And when I needed warranty work on a on a brand new MacBook Pro, I could not get an appointment. It's not that I couldn't get one soon. It was the appointment time was listed as never. And <laughs> so I just I had no choices at all. And it's like, well, why do you even bother to have that as, as an option if I can't ever get an appointment? So to be able to go to authorized shops, and there's a ton of authorized shops around me, would be really nice for warranty level work. I've even, I even had Apple, when this happened to me, I called them and I was like, well, what am I supposed to do if I can't get an appointment? And they said, oh, well, here's a certified place you can go to. And I went to them and they said, no, we can't help you. Apple actually sent me to a place that couldn't help me. So to be able to have this for, for Max is really good. I do have to say, being in the after times, not the before times now, my husband Steve um, had uh, a problem with his MacBook Pro and he sent it in for repair and it was not gone from our house for 48 hours. It was unbelievable. We got He got emails like every three hours. That's okay, great. it's at UPS, it's here, it's being shipped. It's been, they've opened it up. They've figured out what's wrong. They've replaced the part. He just got mails all the way along. It, it was like 36 hours. It was crazy good. I don't know if, if that's, demand, or, you know, all of them are going to be like that, but it was great. Right, right. Your mileage may vary, but but mm -hmm. yeah, at least, at least it worked. Uh, and if you're out there saying, well, wait a minute, I took my Apple uh, product to a third party. I took a Mac to a third party to be repaired. In warranty repairs were authorized previously. This is the change here is now non-warranty repairs can be done uh, by third parties, which means the third parties, they could make those repairs before, but they weren't supported in any way by Apple. Now they'll get parts, they'll get training, uh, they'll, they'll be able to 
have better access to the information they need. And uh, I can't imagine that, you know, the pushes for right to repair laws uh, didn't, you know, maybe coax Apple along this path. They'd already done it for iPhones. Of course, they were going to do it for Macs, but uh, certainly didn't hurt, put it that way. I couldn't even get it on the warranty once. <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's really bad. I love that. Bring your, bring your product in never. <laughs> uh, folks, if you want to get all these tech headlines each day in about five minutes on those days when you don't have enough time to listen to the full 30-minute DTNS, get Daily Tech Headlines. We deliver it five minutes each. Subscribe at dailytechheadlines.com. Allison hosts many excellent podcasts, and one of them is called Taming the Terminal, a delightful journey where Bart Bashatz teaches Allison how to use the command line. Bart has created a set of comprehensive show notes to go along with that series. So, Allison, you wanted for a long time to take those show notes and make them into a book, which you have now done. Congratulations. That's super awesome. Uh, what finally got you going on this project after wanting to do it for so long? Well, when I first looked at it, so Bart has these terrific show notes. And I, like you said, I'm just the stooge in the audio. I don't do any of the heavy lifting of writing the uh, show notes. But he's got these in a blog format, and I tried doing it like using uh, iBooks Author and some other tools, and it was just a nightmare. It wouldn't work. And I tried to get good friend of DTNS, Shelly Brisbane, to help me, and she said, no, it's, it's, it's hell on earth. I'm not going to do it for anybody. And I said, okay, teach me. She said, no, it's too hard to do that. So I just kind of had it on the back burner for a while. But a wonderful listener of the show, a woman uh, named Helma Vanderlinden, uh, it has a PhD in, I forget what, but she's a really, really smart person. She was able to write code and take open source tools to turn this website into an ebook. And it's not just an ebook in one format, it's in all the formats. So she has a nightly build that creates a PDF in A4. It does a PDF in a eight and a half by 11. It does an, uh, a Mobi that you can email to yourself on your Kindle book. It does an Apple Books version with an embedded HTML player, which Apple will not allow in the bookstore, and an Apple Books version that goes into the Apple Bookstore that doesn't have the player. So she, the, the, the really luscious thing about this was Bart created all of this content under a Creative Commons license. I created the podcast under a Creative Commons license. So we open sourced what we were doing. She was able to take uh, like 12 different open source tools, open source programming languages, open source libraries, uh, using uh, we used Git to write the book, so so I do all of the editing of the book and and writing all of the the pieces of it and automating it was all done with open source tools, and then we were able to give it as a gift to Bart, where we put it into his Git repository at bartofficer.net. So it, <laughs> it's just like this circle of happiness. If, if you want the full details on this, they're, they're fascinating. And, and Allison has them uh, over at podfeet.com. We'll have links to, to posts about that here. But I think one of the most fascinating part of this is the open source community making this possible in a way that proprietary didn't. Yeah, yeah. So when, when I, I went around, you know, putting it into different places, I went to put it in the Kindle store. You'll notice I said you can email yourself the Moby. That's because uh, Amazon would not let me put it up for free. I have to put it up for a minimum of a dollar. And it's kind of like, well, it's worth way more than a dollar. So I'm not going to put it up for a dollar. We're actually looking at, is there some way I could put it up for maybe five bucks and the revenue we give it all to archive.org, which is where all the audio files are try to do some sort of transfer like that. But it was kind of kind of funny, especially in these days and times that I'm not allowed to give something away for free on Amazon. Yeah, and you would think that there would just be a tool out there that's like, oh, uh, upload your your text and we'll convert it into all the book formats you want. But but there was no service. What there was was a, a sequence of, of open source tools that you definitely you know, needed someone to go and navigate if you read through uh, her experiences, Dr. Vanderlinden's experiences. Uh, you know, it didn't, didn't work the first time out, but because it was an open source situation, it wasn't costly to switch to a different thing or to, you know, once she had converted it down to Markdown to say like, well, now I think I want to convert it in this other thing uh, because everything was free and there were people willing to help uh, in oh. fact, didn't she even get a bug named after her or dedicated to her or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she ended up figuring out there's a, 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 a tool called ASCII Doctor, which came from the original ASCII Doc, which predates Markdown. And ASCII Doctor is a lot like Markdown, but it allows you to write a book. It's made for making a book. And she got into it. And she got to know the developer. And we she brought the developer into our 
private secret from BART Git repository, and he was helping with it. So the the people who were contributing, and now uh, we're we're in the process of uploading a uh, a new chapter to the book right now. We just recorded a new one yesterday, and uh, a guy just submitted fixes uh, typos that he found in the latest version. So there's just people helping each other, and and they've. Uh, They've come out with uh, updates to ASCII Doctor that solved a couple of problems that we had, and it's just been, it's been really joyful to be able to do all this, not just for for free, as you say, but to be able to have people helping people, and it all based on a product that in and of itself is an open source project. Yeah, the the free I think is most important in in making you feel like you didn't waste your time. Like, oh no, I sunk all this time, and now now I have to pay for something else, right? It's like, yeah, well, yeah. That, I tried that. Let me. It's 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 easy to try something else. But I love that idea that in the course of making this. And granted, this isn't for everybody. This isn't the the one click solution that you would recommend to the novice. You you have to want to do this the way Dr. Vander Linden did. But the payoff is not only was she able to make your dream come true, so to speak, <laughs> but she actually improved ASCII doctor in, in, yeah. in the course of doing it too, is, you know, so it kind of pays it forward. Yeah. Yeah. That was fantastic. I do want to mention, uh, Tom said, we have a link to the blog post, but it, 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 there is an audio recording about an hour of her explaining the process she went through. And it's, if nothing else, you will walk away realizing that she's a freaking genius. I mean, she's <laughs> amazing. So uh, the fact that my name is on the title of the book and she did all the heavy lifting of that, Bart did all the heavy lifting of the, uh, of the text. Um, I took, uh, you know, second billing on it, but my name should be in a real little font because I just did the podcast part. You're the, you're the Steve Jobs. Uh, yeah, I'm to the her visionary. Steve, to her Wozniak, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, she does all the work. I'll take the credit. She and Bart, right? <laughs> uh, and then, of course, I you know, if people don't know, the, the whole point of this was to to make a, a wonderful surprise for Bart. I mean, the point was, I guess, to make it easy for people to read it as well. But but you were able to to put a smile on his face. It sounded like. Oh yeah, yeah. And Bart has been on DTNS, so see, it's a, another big circle of uh, of ah, happiness here. Exactly. Well, well, another uh, circle if, of happiness. Oh, go ahead, Tom. No, I was just going to say, if you want to check out the book, podfeet.com slash TTT book, but we'll mention it again. Uh, we'll also mention Discord. Yes, we're not going to forget you, Discord, because we love you so much. If you want to join the conversation that's going on in our Discord 24-7, you can join by linking your Patreon account, patreon.com slash DTNS. Oh, look at that. It's a mailbag. Oh my gosh, there is a mailbag. And it comes from John. John points out that creators and viewers on YouTube may be wondering why they're not getting email, email notifications about new videos that are getting posted by people that they subscribe to. John says, I was wondering why DTNS hadn't posted for a couple of days. Then I came across this. This is from YouTube support. Quote, if you're opted in to get emails about new uploads, live streams, and premieres from channels you're subscribed to, these emails are going away on August 13th. You'll still get notified on mobile via the YouTube app or on desktop via your Chrome browser if you've turned these notifications on. If you haven't turned them on yet, you can do so in notification settings. Now, John says he suspects that many channels may see a large fall in views. However, YouTube says they did this because less than 0.1% of these emails were even opened and that the company was getting feedback from users that they were just annoying. I turned on these email alerts and now I'm getting them. I'm annoyed. Uh, so. I wonder how many people saw the email and went, oh, okay, I can go look at it now. Like, why do you need to open it? <laughs> To click, yeah, but you're right. If you already have YouTube open, and you know, or or it's easy enough to get to, you you may just see the email and not go to it. Uh, I don't know. It's it's probably not going to to affect traffic uh, precipitously. But if you are someone who was listening to this because you had to find it otherwise and wondered why you weren't getting your YouTube alert, well, now you know. Uh, also, uh, came in right before the show because that epic news with Apple, uh, with Apple threatening to to cut them off from the developer program, also came in right before the show. Dennis in rainy Cape Down uh, wanted to point to a keynote from Tim Sweeney at Dice 2020 that kind of presaged all of this. Uh, he says that the heart of his strategy is the two mobile platforms themselves. In his view, they are general purpose computing platforms and that the restrictions being applied is limiting and arbitrary and it should be challenged. He has challenged Microsoft on that very point and got Microsoft to adapt its policies to his satisfaction. So as Tina says, buckle up. It's a long road ahead. At the heart of the matter is the business model of Google and Apple on their respective mobile platforms. So we will be following as 
the battle continues. Yes, we will. We will also be shouting out patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, as we do on every show. Today, John and Becky Johnston, Justin Zellers, and someone who would like to be referred to as you know who. And I'm, <laughs> we, we do know who you are, but we're not going to say because we're respecting your privacy, but you know who. But also because you know who. Yeah. Well, you know who you are, and we know who you are, and everybody else can just take a wild guess, I suppose. Hey, thanks to Allison Sheridan for being on the show today and bringing the knowledge as usual. Allison, what have you been up to, and how can people follow your work? Well, the best place to go is podfeet.com. Unless you just want to go straight to the book, then it's podfeet.com slash book. Taming the terminal, TTT book. Uh, hey, thanks everybody for supporting the show. We have lots of extras on our Patreon. Uh, and if you're not already in there, you might want to check them out. You get bonus shows that look at old rundowns from five years ago and kind of compare them to what we know now. Uh, some great finds in there. I do a weekly editor's desk column where I talk about the creation of the show and the thought that goes into it. Roger does a column every week. Sarah does live with it. It's all there, patreon.com slash DTNS. If you have burn-in questions or feedback or anything in between, our email address to send that feedback to is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 20.30 UTC. Put it on your calendar and find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Lamar Wilson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>